And I just find it, and, and you know, Kez has said, Lee, I'm telling you now, he wasn't drunk. If he was, why would we have let him drive? Why on earth would you do that? And Trevor, you know, he said, I can't remember, but I can tell you now, I know if he'd been drinking, there's no way we would have let him drive. Why, why on earth would you do that? And so, so the toxicology report comes back and it's examined and there's, you can, there's books written about this, Sean Wright, but the interesting thing is when they went into Henry Paul's flat to search it, in, initially these, these couple of coppers go in and they find, I think it's half a bottle of like a, a liqueur and a bottle of champagne type stuff, that's it. And they take it, they recover it and they recover other things from this one bedroom flat, right? About three days later, they go back and search it again. They find enough booze in there to stock a small bar. It was what the paparazzi was doing to her boys that concerned her, not her. Yeah, she was she was upset about it. But as a mother, uh, she was upset about this. And, and she told me she'd been to the Prime Minister then and asked him to pass the, this bill that was going through to get to make more laws on the paps and what they can do and he told her he wouldn't do it. They, she told me this and I have no opinions in politics, I'm not a political guy uh, but it was Tony Blair and, and she said I asked him and he said to me no if I get the paps off you they'll come after my government you're gonna have to live with it for a bit and she said uh, she, yeah it was shocking I, I, was, I was I felt really really angry when she told me that it affected me quite a lot and she said, I don't, I won't tell you the exact words she said, but what she said was, I refused to cry in front of him. I waited until I got out to my car to start crying. But I bumped into her on the, on the ship, on the front of the ship, with massive glass windows. And I was just, I was looking for something. And she turned around, she's obviously been crying. She was really upset. And she said, have you heard about a friend of Versace? And I said, yeah, how? I said, it's really awful, it's horrible. And, she said, what things happen? And I just said, you know, it just looks like it's, um, you know, it, it's been a hit and we just, nobody knows, it's breaking news and all the rest of it. She was crying and she said to me, Lee, do you think they will do that to me? And the way she said it and the context she said it in, I knew it was aimed at either the royal family or the government. And, and at that moment in somebody's um, moment of need and grief and desperation, that was how she felt and and i was like whoa this is uh, one i've got to get out of here because she came very close to me she just wanted a hug and i wanted to hug her you know you know somebody's so upset but imagine if the paparazzi would have caught that on camera hello everybody i'm here with lee sansom who is an eighth He's got eight dans in karate, which is a hell of a lot, and he's doing fantastic work with the kids. He's got karate schools across the country, but you're tuning in today to hear his stories about Princess Diana working as a bodyguard, and that came through his relationship with the Al Fayed family, which we're going to get to shortly. So a huge thank you for joining us, firstly, and congratulations on the karate schools. Yeah, cheers, Sean. Yeah, it's... Uh... The, the the karate schools that we have it's it's became it, it was a it's a lifelong passion really and we've kind of turned it now into we've got a program for athletes and uh, you know we have a very professional schools and my son Damon who was on the uh, Taekwondo Olympic team for twelve years and he's a former kickboxing world champion so he's come back home now and and together. We're, we're doing some great things in our communities with the children and uh, also with our elite athletes, but more, you know, 99% nine, nine of, the, of, of the people that come to us, uh, they're, they're children uh, or young people and they've got a lot of issues and uh, problems with resilience, mental issues and all sorts of stuff. So it's really rewarding using, using our style of martial arts, which is a mixture of karate, taekwondo and kickboxing just to address some of these issues. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's really rewarding. And you're glowing with tranquility, but it wasn't always like that, was it? You went through hooliganism and your sensei basically told you you've got to stop that lifestyle, otherwise you're going to end up in prison. And yeah. you made a decision, didn't you, and you never looked back? Yeah, it was, it was a decision. And it was, I, I think it was after... 
I got into a bit of a fight one, well, a lot of a fight one night, and 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 I went home. You know, your face is swollen up and all the rest of it, and and my parents were going crazy. And I looked in the mirror and I thought, "What are you doing?" And I think it was that moment then that that I kind of realised I couldn't behave like this if I wanted to be uh, a top sportsman. It doesn't. It just doesn't go together. And also with with the karate at that time. Well, I mean, even now. If you can't control yourself outside the dojo, because you're representing the school, aren't you, and the community and and the country as well, you know, I fought internationally. So I think at that young age of uh, you know, 18, 19, I kind of thought, right, I've got a choice here. I can go that way. And I was really good at it. But I, I probably end up in strange ways prison like a lot of my friends. Or I can go that way. And I can I can still fight because uh, I enjoy fighting. It's it's the chemicals that are released into your body that you, you become addicted to it. Like you'd be addicted to anything, like cocaine, drugs, alcohol, whatever. You get the same rush. You get the same rush from fighting and being in that community of like-minded people that kind of support you in what you're doing. And you just get wrapped up in it. And so I did that, but I did it with the karate world. Uh, you know, I was a karate uh, player at the time. Um, and I got my kicks from that. So thank the Lord, I kind of went that way. And that was a massive turning point in my life for many reasons, you know. And Lee, did you serve in the military? Yeah, yeah, I was in the military for, for 10 years. I had a great time in the military, did some fantastic work, different jobs. Uh, so I joined uh, in 1985 as a military policeman. And uh, I'd just come back from South Africa. I was living over there. And I just bumped into an old a school friend in a pub and he was telling me about all the things that the military police do. I was like, wow, I didn't, I didn't even know that world, really. And I thought, that's quite a diverse uh, things you could do. And, and I thought, you know what, I really fancy that. So I, uh, I went to a place called Sutton Coalfield where you used to go there for three days kind of assessments. And then I was an engineer at the time. Um, I, did, I served my time um, as a boilermaker, sheet metal worker in the, like a, a, the local factory. And they, the army wanted me to join the en- engineers, obviously, because I was, you know, I was there. I was a, a tradesman, and I really fought like mad to go in the military police. And, and I remember this major who was talking to me he was he was getting quite angry really because I wouldn't go in the engineers. And, and he said, "Right, if you go with that lot, I'm going to tell you now you'll have no friends. Life will be hell." Da, da, da. And I said, "I'm doing it." So I joined the military police and did my basic training in Chichester. And then I had some great postings all over the world and, I, and, and worked in some really interesting jobs. You know, I thoroughly enjoyed my time. Any hurry moments? Uh, yeah, there was a few. There was a few hairy moments in in Northern Ireland, and at that at that time when I was there, eighty nine, ninety, ninety one time, it was quite busy, you know, and the the troubles as we as we like to call it were still going on. I think people there on both sides of of this uh, trouble would would probably argue it was a war. Um, it certainly felt like that. But I think at that time, you 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 could have had a war on British soil, and that was never going to happen. It's bad for the economy. It's bad for uh, it's bad for everything. So a lot of the stuff that went on then on the mainland as well as over in Northern Ireland weren't reported, um, and, and I understand why. I get that, but it was it was a very very dangerous place to serve, and. Tell us a story of, of a situation you got in. So, so there, there was quite a few, Sean, but what one really, which was was quite uh, was quite uh, frightening, was I, I was working in this one particular role, and I, I was always in civvies, so I had my hair slightly longer to, to blend in, and we had all the civilian vehicles and all that kind of stuff, and. Um, Special branch. I, I was on on like a twenty four hour duty, so somebody had to man the phone at the time all the time, or your bleeper that they had. Yeah. And it was a it was a, a special branch uh, policeman from London. I presume he's from London. Uh, he calls and he gets put in touch with me, 
And the special branch at that time, although it's still now, it's slightly changed, but they used to deal with all the terror types things that were going on. And he said, look, Lee, there's a, there's a soldier down in South Armagh and he's at this female's house and they're getting a, 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 an IRA unit to go and kill him. Could you possibly get him out? And I thought, right, okay, here we go. So I, I called one of the, the lads and we jumped in our car and we've got all our weapons and stuff and, and off we shot. It must have been maybe about, I don't know, half past nine in the evening and it was i remember it was it was cold and there was a bit of sleep blowing and all the rest of it so we got down to the the local RUC station and told them what you know the address what what had happened and this guy what he'd done you see he'd been working there with a infantry unit prior to this and uh he'd been on chat up where you would talk to people coming past you whether it's a, a, a um whether the road was blocked or whatever, and, and you had a position called Chat Up and you would talk to people. So he'd been approached on Chat Up by this beautiful young girl who'd chatted him up. And, you know, it's called the, the Honey Trap. So when he went back to Germany with his unit, they were still in conversation and she persuaded him to come over. And obviously she was going to marry him, everything was going to be good, and it was going to be, you know, everything's going to be great. Uh, young men with their testosterone, eh? So off he went, and so he's in the house, but but he's got a plaster on his leg. He's broke his leg, so he's got a he's got a full length cast on. He was a Scottish from a Scottish regiment, and he's in this house. I didn't know that until until later on. But so we got in the RUC station and said, "Look, we've got to get this guy out." And the RUC guys who were there, they said, "There's no way we we're going into that place." He said uh, the the local infantry battalion were, were in last, there last night. There was there was shootings, there was bombings, and the whole place is lit up. There is no way we're going in without the military. So they get on the blower to the the local colonel. He says, "There's no way I'm taking my guys in there. You're going to die. You're, you're not going to go in." So we were sat there thinking, God, and the time's ticking on, and I'm getting calls from this from this, this policeman said, you've got to be quick. And he's almost counting down to the minute, you know, and, and all of a sudden, it might have been about midnight, something like that. There's a shift change in the RUC station. So the new commander comes on with his guys and the old commander goes. So we, we start getting the feeling from, from the people we're talking to that the new commander's a bit gung-ho and he loves this kind of stuff, right? So this commander comes in and, he, and he's briefed all his, his men. And he comes in and said, uh, gentlemen, what can we do for you? So I tell him the story. He says, great, we're going. I'm like, no. I said, but the military won't go. He said, no, we don't need them. And I'm like, shit. You never went anywhere without the military. You know, I've done similar things like this in West Belfast. And we might have had, I don't know, a big military presence. You might have had 200 people on the ground. So I thought, right, here we go. So we all get into these uh, armoured vehicles. I think it was about four. And we... Now, the thing is that the IRA are going to get there around about the same time we are. And everybody knows it. So we're in the cars, everyone's shouting and just really getting everybody going. And and we got to this place and everybody kind of deploys to... To just kind of coordinate it off. And it's dark and it's 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 really cold and the bit of snow is flying. And we just kick the doors in and just burst into the house, clearing the rooms and everything. And I find this guy in a sleeping bag on the uh on the floor of the uh the lounge. And uh anyway, we grab him, realize he's just in his boxes, realize he's now got a plaster on and drag him back out to the car, get him in the car. And we're off. And this takes probably, I'd like to say it took about 10 hours, but it was probably about <laughs> four minutes. And, you know, you're in the back of your mind thinking, if these guys come here, we're in a, we've are in got a lot of trouble coming our way. So that was the adrenaline was going and, you know, you got back and it was just incredible experience. Yeah, and you didn't have time to think about it, you know. Uh so that was uh, that was that was up there on the on the scary experience time, you know. 
So Lee, how did you get into bodyguarding? So um, what I'm sure was when I left the military, um, I was determined not to go into security. And I don't know why, because it wasn't like it is now. The close protection industry was very, very small, uh, very small, very well paid. And uh, it was organized by only a few kind of people then, usually ex-SAS, ex-military police, because uh, it was military police that did all the close protection, you see. And I'd done some work in witness protection when I was over in uh, Northern Ireland as well on, on, a, on another um, job I was doing. So I, I, I went into engineering, back into engineering. I probably lasted about a week, two weeks, just couldn't deal with it. Uh, and then I started selling um, some kind of insurance type stuff. Uh, I was really good at it, made a load of money. And I, and, I, and I thought, I've just got to persevere with this. And I did that for about, probably about three months, four months. Hated every minute of it, but could just do it. Um, and then I got a... Somebody, somebody at the local military police unit. I settled near where I uh, Donington, where where I where I left. I settled in a beautiful little place there called Newport. Um, gorgeous little house by the canal, very peaceful. And uh, somebody said, "Oh, uh, the Al Fayed team are looking for new members." There's a guy, Paul Hanley Greaves, he was called, new head of security, and I knew him from Ireland. And so I thought, right, I've got to get out of this insurance. This is killing me, man. So I gave gave him a call. He said, Lee, come down to London. We're doing interviews. So off I went down to London. And uh, you had to do uh, various tests, various medicals, uh, quite in depth. And then you had to do a handwriting sample. You know, when they read about your personality... Have you seen it? I'm sure. Yeah, when they do all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if you're big old, big old handwriting. Uh, you know, if you're an extrovert, all big. Yeah, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, well, uh, Mr. Firehead, uh, or the or the bosses, as you used to call him, uh, he was big into that. He had it done for everybody, and it's it's when you see it, it's absolutely insane. So, because Paul wanted to start something really quick, he says, "Lee, you don't need to do your handwriting. Just get, just come down." So within a couple of days, I was down on the job. But the other lads who was there when I was there. They did the handwriting test, and some some didn't pass it purely because of that. That's not true, isn't it? But you know, when you believe in something, and I, I've seen the results of some of these, and it is that person to a T when they do it. But uh, this is funny. One of the lads, because uh, he had really bad handwriting, when he went home, he got his wife to fill it in for him because he didn't know what it was. Right, and I was there when it came back, and, and, and Paul was having a laugh. And I said, well, what's the score? He said, well, it comes back that he's three months pregnant. I'm serious. <laughs> right. Anyway, this lad got a job in the end, and he was like, we, we've never let this down. Can you, he didn't even know his wife was pregnant, and neither did she, by the way, and she was pregnant. Wow. Nuts. Wow. Nuts, isn't it? <laughs> so how long did it take you when you got the job to actually meet Mr. Fired, the boss? Right, so it was a... It was a procedure that they, they used there. So what we used to do is go down to his, his, his kind of residence and some uh, offices he has on Hyde Park, a massive complex, three buildings all intertwined. And we call it the bubble. Uh, and it was in his, um, his residence block. And in there, there were really rich people that lived on all these floors. I think the first uh, up to... If I can remember rightly, maybe the ninth floor, and then the next floor was Dodie Fayed's, and then, and then the family had theirs, and they had the offices on top. But you had really well known people, and not so well known, but extremely rich people that had their flats there one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, four bedroom. And uh, and some of them, they only, they only went there two, three weeks a year. And they were fully staffed as well. But I mean, they were it's so super expensive. but. We had like a little reception and a, and a glass thing there. So for the first um, week or so, you just sat in the bubble and watched everybody that came in. So you could familiarise yourself with the personalities in the office, you know. And then, uh, 
and then you'd learn all about the family and, and where they were and who was who, who was who were related to who, how they were related. And then you'd learn all the floor layout. Uh, and it took about two weeks because we had all little secret doors and secret cameras and buzzers that let doors open and evacuation routes and all this kind of stuff. And then the next thing, the next bit of the test, you still haven't got the job now, is that uh, when Mr. Fired used to come down the lift in this in this building, if he did come down the lift in that building, and the ve one of the vehicles would be, or the vehicles would be waiting to take him to Harris or wherever he was going, all you did is you opened the lift, but you weren't allowed to speak to him or look at him. It's just so he could come out the lift and look at you, which I, I, I know now why, but at the time I was like, oh, that's a bit weird. And then the next time, you do it, maybe a couple of days later, you, you could speak to him and you could say, uh, good morning, Mr. Fired. And then he heard you. So now he's seen you, now he's heard you. Now he can make an opinion on whether he likes you or not. If he doesn't, you're gone. If you if he does, you, you stay. <laughs> wow. That's weird, isn't it? <laughs> but, but with working in that industry for as long as I have, uh, you know, Sean, if I was to have a, a team with my family, I would do the same because... I spent more time with his family than my family. And you imagine getting up and not liking somebody and you're going to see them all day. It's not going to happen, is it, when you're a billionaire, you know. <laughs> and then this is the interesting thing, you know, Sean, when I talk about high-performance teams and things like this, um, I do talk about Mr. Fired. And when I first got there, I didn't understand how rich he was. And one of the, the admin people said, Lee, you've got to understand this. So you understand what, what you're dealing with. And this is how it was explained to me, and it is super cool. So in volume, if you had a 25-metre swimming pool, you know the regular ones, we have the leisure centre, sports centres, things like that. If you got like a, a pint glass and took a pint glass out of the water, in terms of volume, that's a millionaire and the remaining water's a billionaire. Mad, eh? Now, this, is even, this even gets worse. If you talk in terms of grams, uh, a walrus just so happens to be a millionaire. It's 12 Boeing 747s in terms of weight is a, mil a billionaire. It's mad, isn't it? Now, the one that really wow. got me was if you save, I think it's 246 bucks a day, in 10 years' time, you'll have a million. If you save sixty-seven thousand pound a day, <laughs> it would take you fifty <laughs> years to be a billionaire. Oh, grief! Now, now, when you understand that, you understand what he does, why he does it, and and how he does it. And I just found it fascinating just to be around him and that family. Where did his money come from? Hmm. Well, he, he started uh, just as a poor kid in Cairo. And I think he was selling hoovers or something door to door at one stage. And then he met his first wife, uh, and she was one of the Khashoggi family, and they made a lot of their money from arms dealing. I mean, legally arms dealing, but arms dealing. And then I think through his networking and, and, and his desire, to go where he wanted to go. He was such a driven man and, and, and you know, he, he is, he's still alive, you know. Uh, and he worked his way up uh, and then he got a shipping line. So he had his own shipping line and then he was connected with the, uh, the Sultan of Brunei or Oman. Sultan of Brunei, I think. I've just come in, I've just walked in, my head's a bit... So anyway... This Sultan, he does a lot of work for him. And then what he does then is he buys Harrods. Uh, and, and Tiny Rollins, who was trying to buy it at the time, uh, he, he, there was a big court case and all the rest of it. And what Fire did, in a nutshell, was he used this, like, credit card from the Sultan to buy Harrods. But he's, now, but he's selling his shipping line. Anyway, when it when it goes to court, essentially what happens in a very very small nutshell, and there's lots of things going on as well at the time, um, the Sultan goes to court and said, "Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. My money's his money." 
I don't, he didn't steal any money to do this. I, he would have my blessings and he doesn't need to ask me. So then he gets thrown out, but they put a smear on him by saying, well, you didn't actually do anything wrong, but it was ungentlemanly. Is that a word? Ungentlemanly, I think is the word. Ungentlemanly, yes. Yeah. yeah. So that's enough for him to lose the royal seal of approval and everything. And, it, and that's why he couldn't get his passport for some of the... People listening who don't uh, don't know the history of it, uh, all his family were here. They all had in, uh, British residency, but they wouldn't give it him because of this one thing and the amount of things he did for for the local communities and the children's hospitals and things like that that went unreported, um, and the people he employed and the money he brought into the UK. It just blew my mind. But, but then it went for the cash for questions thing which I was involved with. And what he did, he started asking the MPs to ask questions in the House about why he hasn't got his passport, to start lobbying people, and you know, that's what he was doing. And they wouldn't ask the question, but he's paying them the money. And they're going on holidays, all paid for, to the Ritz in Paris and everything. But they're not asking the questions. So he had enough of this. And he went to the, the newspapers and said, right, you need to listen to this. And he just told it all. And it brought the government down. So he's now even less popular than he was. So, But he, he's, he's a very strong-minded guy. He's an amazing guy to watch. I used to love watching him do his business. Incredible guy. And he was meticulous when he was walking through Harrods, if he noticed anything out of place? You you could not believe it, Sean, honestly. You know, he's, he's got Harrods, he's got an airline, he's got this, he's got that, he's got businesses all over the world. And every day he would walk through Harrods, sometimes for 20 minutes, sometimes for two, three hours. But every single day he would go, walk through, and then go up to his office. But as he's walking through, and he's crowded with people, he's got all these bodyguards around him. It's insane in Harrods, isn't it? It's, it's a crazy place. And he'd see some dust. I remember one time, there's, there's a bunch of umbrellas and one was upside down in this umbrella thing. And he, and he, and he stops. And when he stops in, in these departments, they start flapping. And, and he says to the staff, get me the head of the department. Head of the department comes sweating like he knows something's wrong. And he, and he just tore one off him for this umbrella being upside down. And I was like, my God, how did he see that? And it's only when you have your own business, in you know, which which I have uh, a few businesses, that you actually see that. If you don't own it, you don't see it, do you? Obviously, I had my mind on other things. I was my mind was on him. That was my business. But you know, he'd see dust, tiny bit of dust somewhere, and that was. But his his attention to detail was that good that all of his staff in all of his businesses were just super on it. Lee, how big was his security team and what were the individual roles in it? So uh, we we had a setup then. It's all changed now. So I can, you know, I can talk about it, but it's pretty standard now. Uh, wasn't that much then, but basically you, to look after somebody like that, you generally have one team on, one team off, so you get rest, uh, especially on a long-term uh, gig like that. So we we work a week or two weeks on, week or two weeks off, depending on you know where the family were going and which family member you were looking after. So we had about fifty odd guys on the security team and a, and a few girls, really good operators as well, the females and the guys, one of the best teams I've ever worked on. So you'd have. Each family member would have allocated bodyguards and an allocated team from a chauffeur. You'd have your, 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 your bodyguard as such who would be with them all the time. And then you'd have the outer perimeter of the team. So each person had their own place, as you would, and everybody had their own thing that they did. So that when you walked around, everything was really slick, get in and out of cars, get out of cars. Everybody knew I shut the door, I opened the door. Just as simple as that, uh, but down to uh, the, the, the the most minute micromanaging of exactly where do you stand, what are you looking at, where do you go, uh, just so if anything happens, everybody knows 
what everybody else should be doing. And if anybody's taken out, you know you've got to cover their role as well. So it works like a finely, when you get a good team, it works like a, a really finely oiled machine. And, and, and it's, really, uh, it's really good to be involved in that, you know, especially from when you know the industry so well. And I've worked in quite a few really good teams as well, but, but that that particular team was uh, was incredible. I think we we had a a briefing every so often by the person that runs this female. We used to call her Miss Money Penny, and she gave us a briefing. And this we were, we were talking about various things and uh, sat, uh, our phone communications, and everything. We were so far ahead of the time in the technology we had then; it was incredible. Um, but she was saying, I think it was two years, it might be three years, I can't remember, I worked for about four, well, I worked for four years for him. Um, let's call it two years. Out of the whole t team, they had zero days sickness. That's incredible. That's mad, isn't it? Wow. Yeah. That's really good. How did Princess Diana come into this? Hope you're enjoying the podcast. Here's a word from our sponsor, Manscaped. Cannonballs. This summer, it's not about the size of those cannonballs. Thank God, as I can barely see them. <laughs> well, they were big enough to do the job, weren't they, Jen? <laughs> we kicked. It's about making a splash with our friends at Manscaped. Prep for barbecue season by making sure your grill master has the hottest dog seen this summer. When you're at the cookout, let the meat speak for itself with Manscaped's performance package 4.0. It's time to get ready and not sweaty. The Manscaped Performance Package 4.0 has everything you need to guarantee you'll have the most mouth-watering treat at the party. They have built the ultimate bundle for your summer grooming. So, get 20% off and free shipping with the code SEAN20, S-H-A-U-N-20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code SEAN20. Manscaped, the perfect way to get your patties sizzling hot this summer. Thanks for supporting our sponsor. Back to the podcast. Dodie Fire had started seeing uh, the princess and then she came on holiday with the Fired family in, in the, their villa that they had. They sold it, I think, I think it was valued at, I don't know, 70, 70 or million. Uh, so they used to go to Saint Tropez every summer. So they had places where they go every, every year to their, you know, whether it's New York, um, wherever, where they, where they had their places. And, but Saint Tropez was always somewhere they went in the summertime. So I'd been out there for a few weeks and then I came back whilst the other team came on and took the family to Iceland. And, and when they came back from Iceland to Saint Tropez, we were waiting for them. And we knew that the princess and the princes were joining them on a holiday. So that's how I got on that job. And it was it was a last holiday with her children before she died in that incident in the tunnel. And I welcomed her ashore. So she came off the tender, off, off the super yacht, uh, came on shore. And I, I just, you know, said, well, welcome to Santa Pay. And, and she said, thank you. And off she went, you know, but she was... She's, the first thing she said to me as I kind of held my arm for her to get hold of if she needed to, to get out the tender um, onto the jetty, which was on their private beach, she said, oh, what, more heavies? And she, what she meant was more, more bodyguards. And because she'd seen quite a few on her journey, you know, getting off the aircraft, getting onto the, the, the boat or the ship, I should say, uh, coming on the ship. So she was... She, quickly became aware there's a lot of security around, you know. How much did security have to be stepped up when Princess Diana entered the Al Fayed family? Yeah, well, we had to beef it up quite a bit. So we had extra people there, more probably double that we, we'd usually have. Um, but the security protocols and everything was exactly the same. So there wasn't a, there wasn't a heightened stance as such in the team we were at a high stance anyway because mr fired had death threats on him and all sorts of stuff so we we're always operating at a high level uh which m most close protection teams are the, the, the top the elite teams are always working at a high level so all we did was we just got more people 
to to provide security for the residents. So you've got your resident security going around with the dogs and all that kind of stuff. And and they 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 generally come on and they work the evening. And then you have day shift residents uh, security. So it allows the close protection team to come and go as they will without you don't even have to think about the security of the residents because it's all taken care of by the resident security team. You know so. Uh, yeah, so that's what we did, Sean. We just beefed it all up. But we didn't know what was going to happen. And at that time, when you do your risk assessments and, and, and you're looking at, you know, who's possibly going to come uh, and, and do anything to the princess? And it, and it could be anything. It could be uh, taking an inappropriate picture. It could be putting a listening device. It could be a physical attack. She had a lot of stalkers, by the way. Um it could be anybody, but we, we kind of did our assessment and we thought she was heavily involved in the, the demining program uh, and she worked with the Halo Trust. And I've, I've subsequently been back with them and, and talked to some of their teams who were going out into hostile zones. And it was really weird to just go in there, there's pictures of Princess Diana everywhere. Um, but she was heavily involved in, in that project. And we kind of figured that these people that produce these landmines, she's going to put them out of business. And these companies turn over billions and billions. So we, we kind of thought that could be a problem. So we just didn't know. So, you know, we were kind of a, a heightened state of awareness as usual. But we little did we realise it was going to be the paparazzi that was the problem. And it turned out to be the problem right at the end in Paris. But... Um, we had two paparazzi came over. We got a message from the from the ship saying, uh, uh, "Lee, there's some guys to your left on on this path, on this like a rocky path. They seem to be holding cameras. We're not too sure." And so we went to find out a lot, me and my friend, and it was a paparazzi with a minder, very aggressive, extremely aggressive. And anyway, my friend banged this uh, this uh, minder out. It was a bit of an altercation and the cameraman left and we got him the cameras and all the rest of it. And uh, he, he threatened us and he said, right, I'm going to tell them you're here. We figured they were, were going to know we we're here anyway. But um, so off he went. Uh, and then I took the princess and uh, Fire's wife, Henny, Miss Henny we used to call it, or the hen. Uh, I took them out shopping that day. And we went down the town and and as we were going around the town, I was watching her. She had a flat cap on, dressed down and all that stuff. Nobody recognised her. Uh, so there's various reasons, you know, why you can disguise yourself very, very easily and nobody recognised her. And she had it off to a tea. So she was dressed down. I said, um, sunglasses on, cap on. And off she went. But everybody she met... You could see she lit them up. They, were, they didn't know who she was. They were smiling and she had time for everybody. She talked to everybody. I was like, wow, what an incredible woman. You know, you, know, you meet somebody and you just feel their vibe. And I was taken aback by it. I really was. And I thought, hang on, there's somebody special here. This is a very, very special lady. And... And it, it, the interesting thing was, and, and I refer to this as well, as I said, when I'm speaking, I'm doing my high performance uh, bit, that after, after a few weeks with the Fired family, they started to change too. They'd never speak to you. Mrs. Henny would, wouldn't speak to me. Uh, Dodie Fired had never spoken to me. I'd driven him, seen him many occasions. Mrs. Henny, she say hi to me. I actually got on with her okay. Uh, but the kids could be a bit rude. Uh, it did, didn't bother me. I, I, I loved working there, by the way. I had a great um, relationship with all the family. But all of a sudden, Mrs. Henny started smiling. She started chatting. The kids would say, listen to this, mate. It'll blow you away. They'd say, please and thank you. Unheard of. <laughs> Dodie Fired actually spoke to me. <laughs> and I was like, wow, how, how can somebody change a family, you know, in just days? And so that's that's when I first met her. Uh, and then 
when the when the paparazzi came, it was just you've never seen anything like it, Sean. It was hundreds of them, hundreds, and they were on boats, helicopters, and and then it all went wrong. Well, it didn't go wrong. We were kind of mitigating it and all the rest of it, but I looked and I thought, who could live in this daily? It was just incredible to, to to be there and witness that, you know. How did you keep them at bay if it was that intense? <clears throat> well, what we figured out in the end, the, the princess helped out as well. What we figured out in the end, we, there's nothing we can do about it. You know, the, the, we kind of managed the beach so they wouldn't come close on the beach. But uh, we just had to try and get on with it, with them being there. And every vehicle that went out, it was, you had motorbikes around you, these little scooters cutting you in and out. And they didn't know who was in the car, but they just didn't know. And then we started sending decoy cars out and we go on decoy, like little decoy missions. And what we tried to do is we tried to, we tried to create a space for them, for them to at least enjoy an hour or two. So we'd send one, one ship off one way, one ship off another way, knowing we could half them. And then we'd send like maybe three or four vehicles going out. We had all the armored vehicles. So we wanted them to think, where where's she gone? In which one? And and we had some of the girls that were similar looking. So they, you know, so they just didn't know. Knowing full well, within a few hours, they'd, they'd get it. And then we'd go off to a, a, a beach somewhere or, or do something. Or sometimes we actually stayed at the villa and went down on the beach and there was no one there. So we just thought it's like a game of cat and mouse. But we were never speeding. We were never running away from, from them because, one, it's unprofessional. You, you get this thing about bodyguards driving fast everywhere. The faster you drive, the faster you drive into trouble, right? So, you know, there was none of that. It was all managed. Uh, and I remember one day I caught up with this plan and there was a really narrow route in uh, Santa Fe. And I went back there, you know, and did some filming for a documentary on Dodie Fired. And it's just won an award in the States, this documentary. And I, I, I'm in it quite a bit. So I went to Saint Tropez recently, and I've not been back since. And it was, wow, just, I was like, taken back all those years. And I went to this one road, a, a narrow street. And I figured, if me and one of the guys get in this rear armoured vehicle, as we go down this street, we can get out, open the doors, so that even the push and the crush of them would even jam the doors further onto the walls and they couldn't get past. Mm. So we uh, we did that um, and it worked and it allowed the, the princess to get on the on the ship and the ship to get away. And you didn't have the technology we've got now, the social media and all that kind of stuff. And, and off she went and then we drove back and then there was me and my mate. We got on a pair of jet, jet bikes there were, I think, the 1300 Kawasaki three seat jet bikes that we had, as well as all the rest of the jet bikes. <laughs> and we, we went on these jet bikes with all the helmets and all the life things towing behind us. And we went, I think it was about, I don't know, 45 minutes, an hour to get there, going against the tide. When I got there, I was like, I was like, if I never see a jet bike again in my life, it'd be too soon, you know. So we took them there, they played there, and then and we came back on the jet bikes and they went back on they went back on the ship ship and then came straight up back on the beach you know so it all sounds very uh very billionaireish doesn't it and it was it was incredible you know to, and then the princess did say to me one day she said lee she said i've been around a lot of things in my life she said, but i've never seen anything like this never seen this wealth so it shocked her Interesting, eh? Wow. Did she say anything? Do you remember any other things that she said to you that stand out? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. We chatted lots, you know, and uh, I'd take her to the to the ship when it was uh, in San Tropez Harbour. We were about 20 minutes, 25 minutes from there by sea. So I'd take her down backwards and forwards in the tender when she went on the ship. So we had lots of chats on the on the on the, this little uh, Boston whaler, it was a little, a little boat. And then we chat a lot 
on the beach in the morning. So one of my jobs, I always had, I set the beach up, me, me and my friend. So we'd set the beach up and we'd look around for anything that had been left there, obviously, and anything at all. You know, you're looking for devices, any kind of devices or, or, or anything dangerous. So we'd, we'd set the beach up and we'd put all the toys on the beach and we'd have the... the We'd have uh, people from the ship who'd come in and help us and we'd winch everything out, all the boats, bikes, jet skis, everything. And then we would wait there for the family to come down. So we'd start about 7 o'clock in the morning, get all the beach ready, knowing full well nobody would come down until maybe afternoon. But um, the princess used to come down every morning early. Mm -hmm. She'd come down with a cup of coffee or something and she'd sit on these steps and we'd just chat to her like you and I are chatting. Uh, so we chatted about loads of stuff, and one of the big things was that at that time she was the most famous woman in the world, the most famous person in the world, and the media was full of it. And the the, the reason the paparazzi was so aggressive that some of those iconic pictures over in San Tropez, and I'm on one of them on a boat where she's whispering something to me, they'd sell for over a million euros then. Ooh. That's why they were so aggressive. That's a life change, isn't it? That's a retirement plan, that, isn't it, for most people? So uh, she'd sit and chat, and, and you read all these things that the papers had wrote about her, that she was nuts, that she was uh, had this going on with her life and all the rest of it. And this is the thing. Any country that, that read the papers or listen to the news or whatever they make their opinions up on that information right that's it that's the only information they have and i've spoken to journalists about the princess when she said to me, oh lee well you know she was crazy don't you and i said to her have you ever met her and they say no i said well how do you know you've read it by somebody whose view that was and i said you know what she was one of the most down-to-earth sane people i've ever met she had it all there was nothing wrong with her at all and when she told me she was going to live in the States and nobody knew at that time, I should imagine the people that she confided in knew. Um, and she, she, she said, you know, I'm going to live in the States. I need to get away from all this. The British press hate me. Uh, the Americans love me. I like it there. I feel safe there. I just want some respite for this. So I'm moving to the States, um, to Malibu. And it was Julie Andrews' old house that she was interested in, in buying, right? So I, I said to her, naively really now, um, are you taking the boys with you, Harry and William, who were lovely kids, by the way? And she said, no, they won't let me. And I went, okay, well, how's that going to work? And she, you know, I told her about my children and things like this, and, you know, and on previous conversations. And she said... Well, look, I, I probably might see as much of them because on holidays they can come out because they're in private school and this, that, and the other. And she said, I've got to make this work. And I was like, right, okay, wow. What a, what a, a mum said, but it was it was the, it was was the what the paparazzi was doing to her boys that concerned her, not her. Yeah, she was, she was upset about it. But as a mother, uh, she was upset about this. And, and she told me she'd been to the prime minister then and asked him, to pass the, this bill that was going through to get to make more laws on the paps and what they can do. And he told her he wouldn't do it. They, she told me this, and I have no opinions in politics. I'm not a political guy, uh, but it was Tony Blair. And, and she said, I asked him and he said to me, no, if I get the paps off you, they'll come after my government. You're going to have to live with it for a bit. And she said, uh, she, yeah, it was shocking. I, I, was, I, was, I felt really, really angry when she told me that. It affected me quite a lot. And she said, I, don't, I won't tell you the exact word she said, but what she said was, I refused to cry in front of him. I waited till I got out to my car to start crying. How bad is that? Terrible. But, uh, it's, it's, it's hideous, yeah. But anyway, Sean, um, she told me she was going to the States and, and this, that and the other. And isn't it, this is so typical of, of the way we get information in, that after that, I did a piece for... for Mr. Fired in one of the national papers. And I told my story because I was sick and tired of seeing him getting leathered 
for the stuff he did and the stuff about the princess. And I, and I thought, no, you've got to hear this. So I did a piece in the paper. I wasn't working for him then, by the way, but um, but I'm very loyal to the family. And I spoke about my experience and I spoke about this one incident. And then in the, in the subsequent papers for weeks, the papers were commenting on this America thing. And you had all those close friends come in on into the, onto the press, onto TV, saying there was no way she was going to America. It was not going to happen. I was her friend for 20-odd years and blah, 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 blah. So it was massively discredited. Now we know she was going to there. We know the house she was going to go in and everything. I wonder where they got these long-term confident, uh, confident friends or friends she confided in. Isn't it's crazy, isn't it, how it all works? So yeah. Manipulated. Did she it ever mention massive. Charles to you? She didn't know. Didn't mention him at all. Uh, didn't mention him. I didn't hear her say one bad word against anybody. And I remember the Sun newspaper came out with this thing, and how they can write this thing about people, I, I, I just don't get it. And they had a picture of Camilla. And a picture of Diana on the front of the front page of the paper. The Princess Diana one was a beautiful picture of her. The prince, the, the picture of Camilla was the worst picture you could have ever found. And they must have looked for this. And he said he chose this over this, or worse to that effect. Mm -hmm. And I thought, why would you do that? Well, it's to sell papers, isn't it? And uh, and I thought, right. I'll speak to the princess. I've got to tell her this is out because it's, it's it's going to affect her. And then she came down and, and I said to her, "Look, uh, we're chatting on the beach." I said, "I said, have you had your morning newspapers today?" And she said, "Yeah, I have. Yeah." And I said, um, "Have you seen the sun?" And she said, "Yes, I have." I said, "How does that make you feel?" And she said, "Well, it's his choice," and just moved on. That was it. I was like, "Wow." How cool is that? Whew, so you got a sense of a threat from the military companies. You got a sense of the threat from the paparazzi. Was it ever a sense of threat from the royal family? No, no, we didn't know. And I know people have, you know, kind of said that, but no, not at all. But interestingly, we knew we were being watched. We were being watched in the UK. We had MI5 on us and we had other people doing surveillance on us. And and from time to time, we'd catch them and we'd just knock on the car door and say, do you want to brew lads or something like that? And they'd be like, oh, f -f 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 and off they go. But don't forget, we had surveillance experts on the team as well, former MI5, uh, former specialist um, uh, people as well from the military. So we had our own anti-surveillance and counter surveillance drills so we knew we were being watched out there and, and that time when I told you where we blocked the road off the paps were quite a way behind on their little scooters but there was about four or five maybe two or three or four high powered bikes which were not normal and these people got off the bikes these guys and came to us and they spoke to us in military terms like lads are you going to are you going to let us through Right, Mucker, are you going to let us through? And we said, you, lads, you know we can't. And they went, you're not, go you're not going to, are you? And we're not, we're not moving. And they went, yeah, okay, cheers, fair do, lads. Got on their bikes and off they went. Then the paps came and they were like pushing and shoving and really being aggressive and swearing and everything. But when they realised we weren't going to move, after about five minutes, off they went. So the first guys that we met were ex-military simple as that what they were doing there i don't know but what we assume they were doing is they were watching the princess and what was going on and it makes sense and we, and we actually like that that we had some we had some people there that were kind of giving us some cover really if anything happened we knew that the the government would know it was happening so we I, we didn't have a problem with this at all, and and later when I gave evidence in the coroner's inquiry, uh, one of the barristers who were working for either the royal family or, or, or there were so many barristers there, he gave me a really hard time about this, 
And he was, uh, I'll, I'll describe him to you, shall I? He was, he was short, balding, nothing wrong with that, brother, with like patches of hair here sticking out and, and, and quite overweight, right? So he gives me a really hard time about this and the judges sat there. One of the Lord, one of, was it Lord? I can't remember, Lord Stevens or something like that. And I'm, I'm in this, I'm here for about an hour and a half, by the way, um, being cross-examined by all these top barristers. And he's uh, he's saying to me, uh, oh, Lee, oh, no, Mr. Sansom, I put it to you. And I went, I hope you don't, mate. But he said, I put it to you. And he just starts telling me this. So what you're describing is somebody in certain type of uh, shoes, uh, chinos, this type of shirt, and just purely by what they're wearing, you can tell me if they're ex-military or not. And I said, well, also, their demeanour and the words they spoke to me, I can tell you now, 100%, they were ex-military. And I just really give it to him. There's nowhere to go then. So he comes up with this funny quip and he says, Mr. Sansom, huh, uh, um, something like, if I was to ever see you on when I was on holiday dressed like that, I would really be concerned that you thought I was ex-military. And I said, I said, I would never think you were ex-military no matter what you wore. <laughs> and everybody starts <laughs> sniggering. And, 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 and then the judge, and he's got a smile and he says, right, we can stop this line of questioning now. I thought, what are you on, mate? Come on. Well, that was it. That so was Lee, <laughs> Lee, with, with hindsight then, you know, I've read the book, Diana in her own words. And she talks about a threat from Charles and the possibility of it being made to look like a car crash if she died. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Uh and this is the thing. How can I say? If you feel something really deeply inside you, it, it's obviously that feeling has come by what you've seen, what you've, you, you've witnessed and what you've done. So I don't know her life, you know, but... She knew she had trackers on her vehicles. That could have been the press, as we're finding out now. She knows her phone was being listened to, and we we know now what's going on with that piece. But um, she did have certain fears, but also the the things that she's seen in that position that we will never see. We will never understand what goes on at that level. So whatever it was made her concerned. And I know when her friend Versace died, and it looked like it, it was a, 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 an execution by the way it was done. So you know, following that, we we found it wasn't. It, it was it was something else. But I bumped into her on the on the ship on the front of the ship with massive glass windows, and I was just I was looking for something, and she turned around. She's obviously been crying. She was really upset. And she said, have you heard about my friend Versace? And I said, yeah, how? I said, it's really awful. It's horrible. And she said, what do you think's happened? And I just said, you know, it just looks like it's, um, you know, it, it's been a hit and we just, nobody knows. It's breaking news and all the rest of it. She was crying and she said to me, Lee, do you think they will do that to me? And the way she said it and the context she said it in, I knew it was aimed at either the royal family or the government. And, and at that moment, in somebody's um, moment of need and grief and desperation, that was how she felt. And, and I was like, whoa, this is uh, one I've got to get out of here. Because she came very close to me. She just wanted a hug. And I wanted to hug her. You know, you know when somebody's so upset. But imagine if the paparazzi would have caught that on camera. My God. God, one, I'd have been out of a job. Two, I'd have been very embarrassed for compromising her. Um, and can you imagine the stories they would write about that? So oh, I yeah. kind of backed off and, and, and legged it off there, feeling, you know, just as a human being, thinking I really wanted to comfort her then, but I couldn't, and, and quite right. Uh, and I thought, what a desperate place that woman's in, you know. Did anybody else around her die mysteriously? Um. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I've not researched it. I've been very tempted to, Sean. I don't want it to get it into my head, but I do know people that are involved in the inquiry have mysteriously 
died. Now, whether that's, I don't know. I don't look into these things like that, Sean. But I do know, I, I do have conspiracy theories asking me to to get involved in it. And I, and I just don't want to go down that route because I know if I do, it'll take over my head, you know. And so I just, I just don't look into that side of things, you know. What was your last conversation with her? Uh, the last com- the last time I spoke to her, I jumped off the top of the ship uh, in the harbour. We were taken back to get on the aircraft, and we were on the, on the top of the deck. The security team and Harry and um, some of the other children was with us. And he said to me, "Lee, would you jump off the top of the ship?" And I said, "Is I dare you?" Well, somebody says, "Dare you?" You're going to say, "Yeah, aren't you?" So I said, "Yeah, of course I will." And he said, "It's dark," and he said, "It's a long way, Lee." And I said, "Of course it is." He said, "Well." Do it then. I said, I'm not going to jump off the, the top. I'm, I've got my kit on. I'm taking you to the aircraft. I can't go dripping wet over the over, over to the aircraft with, you know, you and your mum and that. And he said, oh, so you daren't then? I said, yes. Listen, I dare, but I'm not going to do it. All right, off you go. So he runs off squealing with laughter with all the other kids. And then I hear this, Lee, Lee. And I look down. It's the princess right on the bottom. They're, they're having uh, dinner. The adults, when the kids were um, hanging out, she said, uh, "Harry says you're going to jump off the boat, off the ship." And uh, uh, I said, "Well, it's not exactly like that." She said, "Yes, he said you you do it for two hundred quid." And I said, "Well, I did say that." And then I thought, Mister Fired, look up. He said, "Lee, there's two hundred quid jump." <laughs> so I jumped off the top of this bloody ship. And then I come back on, you know, swim back up and come back up, and she's there shrieking with laughter and, and talk, you know, shouting at me and all this, and off I go. And that's the last time I spoke to her. So what other interactions did you have with her kids? Um, just I, 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 the way I could best describe it really is, you know, say you're taking your kids on holiday and you had every t- toy you wanted to play with. It was like that. You know, there was times where, you know, we had such a big team, but if I was involved in the kids, we'd always have people watching, you see, so I could just entertain the kids and be their, like, safety person there, because we were on the sea and stuff. Um, so, you know, I taught them to ride the bike, the jet bikes, the jet skis, squirt the paparazzi with a big thing of water coming out the back, uh, and we'd sit there and chat, Um I was doing some kickboxing in the uh, in the we had a, a you know a small gym there and I got the princes there and tell them what because they, they used to like martial arts so um, yeah just doing cool stuff with them you know it was really really it was, a, it was a great job. Did you have any inkling from the young personalities that things would turn out as they ha- have for William and Harry? Um, <clears throat> kind of looking back, yeah. Uh, Prince William was a uh, really measured, lovely kid, a uh, really pleasant, polite boy, um, and v- you know, intelligent and just a, a nice, a nice kid. Harry was a naughty boy <laughs> and full of life and fun, and I just loved the way he was. It reminded me a lot of my son, you know. Um, so they were like chalk and cheese. But you could see they were like really looked after each other. They had that really good bond, you know. So it's so sad to see what's happened now. Really sad. Um, yeah. So those two little boys that, that I knew then, I can see what's happened and why it's happened. You know. Did you know anything about the death of Barry Manicky? No. Okay. So when the news broke about Diana's death, where were you and how did you react to that? So I was, I was at home. I just had a family barbecue. I lived on my own. And um, in, I was washing, I was doing all the washing up, right? I never did that. I waited until the next day. I'm the next day, man, especially when you're partying, you know. And it came on Sky News that this had happened. I was like, what? So... Instantly, I went to my phone and, and had a few missed calls from our operations room, our ops room in, in London. So I was then on 
to the ops room finding out what what had happened and and to be quite honest the first person i was thinking about was trevor trevor reese jones a very good friend of mine and we still speak now you know he's a great guy uh, and and then you know I, I was listening to what was happening in real time so i was ahead of you know everybody else in the world so i knew when she died and i knew that uh, dodie and, and the driver honey paul was dead with trevor um eventually obviously we found out you know he was pulling through and all the rest of it but it was a real shock and, and dodie as well you know i've been around the family for years so i knew the grief and everything that was going to go out it was a really sad time really sad time and then um when i got back to work uh, maybe a week later the uh it was it was like walking into someone's house whose son had died it was horrible mm. and i really felt for the family and all the stuff that was going on in the news the paps about the princess and that and some of the stuff wasn't that kind and and i'm thinking this family just lost a son was anybody out there really understand this so it was it was a a, re a really sad time and also the their house you know the flowers that were left outside you've seen it all on the television we have to take them in at night it was it was just too many you know almost blocking the road it was just it was just an incredible time in the world and that national outpouring of grief that it's the first and only ever well they might have had it subsequently but it's the first time the british public had ever behaved like that i remember it now and nobody could understand this massive outpouring of grief worldwide from a woman they had never met yeah it was she was like you said the most famous woman in the world just changing my back hope you're enjoying the podcast here's a word from our sponsor rocket money many of our viewers have saved thousands using rocket money to save the money off subscriptions they didn't even know about rocket money cancels subscriptions for people that are tricky and time consuming rocket money also alerts you to subscriptions that can save you money Try it free for 30 days, just enough time to try it, and then completely forget about it. In fact, over 80% of people have subscriptions they forgot about. You could be wasting money and not even realizing it. Rocket Money helps you find those forgotten subscriptions so you can stop paying for ones you don't use. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. Stop throwing your money away. Cancel unwanted subscriptions and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. That's rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, rocketmoney.com slash Sean. Thank you for supporting our sponsor, Rocket Money. Enjoy the podcast. And, it's, and the interesting piece on this, Sean, is, is, is something I've used... Um, and I've used it to, for, for sports people, Olympic players, um, CEOs, and, and things like this. And this is the interesting thing about that lady and why she was loved in the world. But I'll tell you why, how I come to think about this. It might put it in some perspective. So I was on a roof in Libya. And, I, and I'll, I'll be really quick with this. And we thought we were going to die. So there's rockets and missiles landing, and it was just horrendous. We were getting small arms fire. We were the last people to leave Libya. And we had ISIS pushing in. We had the militias fighting. We were right in the middle of it. And then we learned that the, the person who was in charge of this thing that I was working on for uh, the European Union, housing... I was in charge of their course protection. They hadn't ordered all the ammunition. We had no spare ammunition, just what we were carrying. So we were going to die, effectively. So they're shredding all the, all the stuff in there and we're getting ready to do something, but we can't get out. So we're on the roof, and we've got our positions. Um, and we were talking about who was going to kill who with the last round. And, and you probably had experiences showing yourself when you think you're going to die at that moment in time when you have nothing at all in your life. You start thinking about different things, you know, and generally you start thinking about the people you love. And you go through that person and, and you feel joy and happiness and, 
and because I had to get my mind on what I was going to do, I didn't have time for feeling sad. You just reflect your life. And you think about your children and, all, and with, with pride. And, you know, for, for me, it was, you know, and make a few videos saying goodbye to everybody and this, that, and the other. And it's on your, on your cloud so they can access it if they need to. And you do all this, and then you get on with the job in hand. And, I, and I've had this a few times. But on that time, when I was thinking about people, I thought about the princess, and this is what freaks me out. For months later, I kept thinking, why didn't I think about her? I didn't know her that well, you know? And then it caused me to do a lot of research into it and, and how high-performance people, which she certainly was, perform, and how does it work? And and they say that you're, um, you know, you're, your invisible PR that you do, people see it. The things you do for others with passion, not for the photo shoot, not for this. And, and we as human beings can see that. And when you look at some of the stuff she did with the AIDS victims and this, that, and the other, she put herself right out there. Probably one of the first uh, people we've ever seen hug an AIDS victim. And when And when people were seeing this all the time, there's no story behind it. There's no... She didn't have a, a massive campaign behind her telling everybody how good she was. It was just her as a human being. And having met her, she changed my life. And, and when I say to people about Diana, how do you feel about her? 99% say, I loved her. <laughs> and there's a difference between love and like, isn't there? Massive difference. And she had that special thing. That, that makes people want to, to like her, to be like her. And when you get a person like that, had she been, a, had she been alive now, I, I know that the things she were creating then for children and, and various things around the world, I think she would have made a massive difference to what we're doing now. She could have changed a lot of things that we're having problems with now. But obviously, she she's she's not here, so it never happened. So Lee, we've interviewed all kinds of people with all kinds of perspectives on Diana's death, from Lady Colin Campbell to David Icke. There's so many different theories, and you said that your friends to this day with Trevor Rhys Jones, the bodyguard who survived the crash. What's his perspective on what happened then? Well, De Trevor can't remember. That's the thing with him. That's, that's what that's, it was eating him up. You know. I, when when he he came to, to the family house in Oxted and uh, and he came and and I saw him. He was, he was about my size, you know, six foot two, about fifteen stone, he's a thick guy, ex paratrooper. And he came and I'm looking at this shell of a man, hideous. I think he had 152 pieces of titanium in his face, which they reconstructed from one photograph, just one grainy photograph. Uh, and I saw him, he must have lost half his body weight, uh, and uh, he couldn't walk, uh, other than being assisted by someone. And, and I said, Trev, are you sure you want to go to Doldy's grave, which was on the ground, it was a massive place to have. And he said, Lee, I, I really want to go. I said, come on, I'll take you, mate. So I put him in a golf buggy, and I drove him out there, probably about, I don't know, about half a mile, drove him out and drove him to where Dodi was laid to rest. And I, I picked him up like a child out of the, the car and we went over to the graveside and he was really upset and he's looking and, and, and confused as well. And it was, it was a really emotional time for me and him. And, and I'm holding him and he said, Lee, I've been involved in the biggest thing the world has ever seen and I can't remember a thing and it just eats me up. That's crazy, eh? He can't remember a thing. So what? Um, like he's not got complete amnesia for his whole life, though. What do you know? What the last no. thing was he remembered? Uh, he can remember being in Paris. He could be remember things before, but he just could not remember anything um, from probably leaving the hotel to to when he recovered in hospital. So it was just that that, that space of time before the incident. Yeah. Yeah, and what actually um, happened. So what what do you think about the rumours that uh, she was pregnant and stuff like that? 
I, I tell you what, I don't know. I know when it came out in the press when she was in Santa Fe and there's a picture of her there with a, a swollen tummy and is she pregnant? And when we looked at it in the press, we said, that, that's, been, that's been doctored, man. She wasn't like that. But, but back in the day then, you know, they were doing stuff like that. So the picture wasn't a, a, a true picture of her. But we had a little sweepstake, you know, because we didn't know. And it never crossed our minds until we saw it in this... In this um, newspaper a national newspaper um so whether she was pregnant or whether she wasn't i don't really have an opinion on it i don't i just don't know but what I know do you sorry sorry go on, go on, go on. Go on. keep going keep going, yeah, keep going. when you read the conspiracy theories and and obviously i know a lot about what happened in the tunnel and all the rest of it and the time delays and all that stuff and I get when things are uncertain and people just say, I don't get that. It's easy for people to, to make reference to various things. So although I've not got involved in it, I know we, we know now that the, the, the accident didn't kill her. It was, the, it was the time delay on getting from the accident to the hospital. That's why she died with a small bleed in a, one of her lungs. One of the latest pathologists has said. So, you know, people ask, you know, why? Why was the, the crime scene? Well, was it a crime scene? Why was it washed and jet washed shortly after? Why were the cameras off? Why didn't they find these bikes uh, that would follow in her? Um, and there's a lot of whys there, isn't there? And I just don't know. I, I think it was an accident. I think it was. I think it was caused by somebody else in that tunnel. And I think those people were working for a government just keeping an eye on her. I think it was just something that, whether they were involved or not, I don't, I, I think it was just a tragic action. She might have nipped something, hit something. I don't know, or, you know, the driver. But, um, but, I, but, I, but what I do think is that there were people from a government in that tunnel at that time that saw what happened. Lee, can you detail what happened in the tunnel then, please? So, so it depends on what account you, you're listening to. So uh, the driver was speeding, He'd had alcohol, and they run into you know one of those pillars in the tunnel, and 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 the crash hits. Uh, they don't have the seatbelts on. Dodie would never wear a seatbelt. Uh, I'd fall out with him. I would never drive any of the family without a seatbelt. And if Mister Fire caught you doing that, you were sacked. Dodie was a bit of an enigma. He hated wearing his seatbelt, uh, but he knew when I when I got in with him, he'd put it on. I just wouldn't move. I'd call his dad. So you need to speak to your son. He won't put his seatbelt on. I didn't care. <laughs> I worked. I worked for Mister Fired. I didn't work for him. Uh, and so Trevor had his seatbelt on. When he left, he didn't have it on. And this is another conspiracy theory saying, "Well, he then put it on later." Well, that's standard drills for a bodyguard. Uh, you know, when you're leaving, you don't put it on, and when you go to a, when you get into to your venue, you take it off. And there's a lot of reasons for it, but one of the reasons in Northern Ireland you used to do it, you used to set off and leave your door open. If there's advice device on, you'd hope it'd blow you out your car if you couldn't check your car if you're in an area where you couldn't check it. So it's probably ingrained into a lot of the British mill. Um, so him having his seatbelt on in the tunnel and he didn't when he was setting off, that's standard, uh, standard drills, but... When the car hit, his body could have a seatbelt on. He took all the impact for the princess. So she only had a couple of, a broken arm, I think, and a, a cut on her leg and this tear in her lung. So her injuries weren't life-threatening at that time. What happened to them made them life-threatening and, and, and eventually killed her. This is absolutely mind-boggling. So how far away was the hospital that could have saved her life? I don't know the exact distance Sean I, it's something I've, I've, I've really I, I've looked at it a lot but it's something I, I try and detach myself from but I think I'm right in saying that you and I could walk there quicker than it took ca carrying someone than it took for that vehicle but but apparently the the, the French claim it was protocol at the time and whether it was or whether it wasn't but it was interesting that we, we had the inquiry into the accident. Years later, we had the coroner's inquiry. And a lot of the evidence that came out in the coroner's inquiry contradicted the first inquiry. But by then, it was out of the public mind. It was gone. It was, you know, let's move on. 
But the French pathologists and their toxologists didn't come and give evidence, and the doctor didn't either, I believe, um, because he said it wasn't in it wasn't in line with their national security plan. Wow! When this starts happening, and it gives people calls to think, I don't get that. That's what the issue is, and I think the issue is because there was people from government agencies there. They started manipulating the story, and that's when people start going, "Hang on, I don't get this." And then once you start, you can't stop. So, uh, yeah, I do think there's people in that tunnel who could tell us exactly what happened. I do think it was an accident. I don't think it was uh, it was any attempt to, to kill her. I think it was just purely an accident. And there's people in there that went, we can't be seen to be here, and they bugged out. Lee, are you aware of what happened after the crash then, like the time... Uh, it took to, for an ambulance to come, how long she was in the ambulance, you know, how, how long after the accident she actually died, things like that. Well, I think she was still alive when she got to the hospital, but but the time scale and all, all the rest of, of, of that, it's, uh, if people are interested, you, you can, you know, the, you can read about it, you can, you can get access to the coroner's inquiry and read exactly what happened. But the time scale of when the ambulance kept stopping and starting and stopping and starting, and, and the doctor tells his story as, as to why that was the case. But at the time, I think um, most people thought, that can't be. That can't be right. It was, it was certainly not happening in the UK, but the, the French are adamant that it was their protocol to do that then. I don't know. To stop and start for what reason? I think it was to stabilise her, to give her treatment. So there is a story behind it as to why it happened, and and you, be, I mean, everybody thought at the time that's that's crazy. Why would you do that? You've got you've got a casualty in your vehicle. You've got to get them to where they're going to get life support, and you've got to get them there quick. And that's generally when you triage people and you do all this. The people you've got to get them to that specialist in a in a window of time, and if you don't do it, the likelihood is they're going to die. We know that, and we knew it then as well. But apparently, the French system they didn't work like that. But who knows? So, Lee, do you think that there were vested interests out there that were rooting for such an accident, or may have gone so far as to take advantage of the accident? In what way, Sean, to take advantage? Could have interfered with the the process of her getting the necessary uh, medical treatment to save her life? I don't think so. I think that would have been so... If, if, you, if, you, if you wanted to kill someone, this is one of the most complicated ways of doing it. <laughs> They'd be far easier. You know, and it's... I think the doctor who did what he did, he might have been overwhelmed by when he found out who was in that ambulance because he didn't know the, the scene. And I think once he found out who was in, he might have been in shock. I don't know. I just don't know. So if you'd have been on duty that night, what would have happened? Well, I, th I say this, uh, and, and I say it because I know it's true. They both would have had their seatbelt on. And, and I know... Trevor and Kez were working out there. They were working 18-hour days. You're hanging. You're tired. You can get ground down by the principal or the people you're looking after. You know, they might have just have had enough of Dodie saying, fighting with him over this seatbelt issue. I don't know. But I can see why things happen. But I was always strong on that. Always strong on that. Even when I've worked out in the war zones I've worked in, you know, we, we lost a, a group of guys in Somalia the, the, their uh, four before vehicles uh, crashed and it killed them. Um, they didn't have the seatbelts on. You know, when these things start turning, it's like a it's like a tumble dryer and you're in it. And so I've always been big on seatbelts. And what about so people to... wear their seatbelts? What about drivers consuming alcohol? Yeah, this, this is this is this is another thing where it doesn't add up. 
So only Paul, I've, I've spoken to Kez and I've spoken, who says this guy hadn't been drinking late. Uh, uh, you, you don't drink when you're working. And, and you know, when you've been, Kez was a, a Royal Marine and a former Royal Marine policeman whose job it was to go and lock up drunken Marines and stuff like that. And, and so he knew when somebody had been drinking or not, as we all do. But, but when you've worked in that environment, you, you're quite aware if people have had a drink. And I just find it, and, and you know, Kez has said, Lee, I'm telling you now, he wasn't drunk. If he was, why would we have let him drive? Why on earth would you do that? And Trevor, you know, he said, I can't remember, but I can tell you now, I know if he'd been drinking, there's no way we would have let him drive. Why, why on earth would you do that? And so, so the toxology report comes back and it's examined and there's, you can, there's books written about this, Sean Wright. But the interesting thing is when they went into Omni Paul's flat to search it, in, initially these, these couple of coppers go in and they find, I think it's half a bottle of like um, a liqueur and a bottle of champagne type stuff. That's it. And they take it, they recover it, and they recover other things from this one bedroom flat, right? About three days later, they go back and search it again. They find enough booze in there to stock a small bar. So the question is, did they overlook it or was it put there? And in the coroner's inquiry, there was a statement that came over from one of these policemen that said, yes, it is likely that when the first two policemen went there, that drink wasn't in there. So the question is, who put it there and why? That's the question. And it's almost like the elephant in the room. But I think when time goes on, people, you get tired of it, you forget about it. But I think had that coroner's inquiry and all that evidence that we then knew years later have been available on the first inquiry into it, we might have had a slightly different outcome. Who knows? So do you think there were vested interests manipulating the official narrative after the fact? Definitely. Why? I don't know, Sean. Why? I don't know. I think that the French might have gone, we've made a massive mistake here. We better start not covering up. We better start making it right. The booze one, that's different. I don't understand why they would have done that. Unless it's to take the blame and put it squarely on Omni Paul's shoulders, who had been drinking... But back in the day, here you could drink two pints and drive. There's nothing wrong with that. Everybody did it. The police did it. The judges did it. Everyone did it. It was a law, wasn't it? But I know in France, everybody has a drink and, and they drive. They have all the little flip or tiny little glass of wine. They all do it. So why they did that, I'm not sure. I'd love to know. I don't think we ever will. Do you think because she went on TV and spoke frankly about the royal family and her relationship with Charles, that it served the interest that she was out of the way? I don't think so, no. I, I think it, it was a bridge too far, that. She was, she was so famous, so well known. I, I don't think that that seriously entered anybody's mind. It, it was just... I don't, I don't think so, because I say at that time, she was the most famous woman in the world. And even attempting to do that, she had a, her own gang of people that followed her everywhere, the media. You, you, had, you struggled to get a space to do anything. And no, I, I, I don't think that... I think people might have thought it, but I don't think actually anybody had planned to do it. I just think it was uh, an accident in the tunnel. Whether she clipped the side of a French security detail or something like that, or some, somebody they had paid to be in there, she clipped that vehicle, which there is evidence to say it did clip a vehicle, which was never found. I was not, it goes on and on and on, Sean. It, it does, it, you, you know, it, there's so much stuff that went on. But I think it's a good possibility that that happened in the tunnel and they just couldn't seem to be there and then they had to extract 
And uh, isn't it strange, though, in a capital city like that, that's got cameras everywhere, <laughs> the cameras weren't on in the tunnel. OK, it could be another coincidence, I get that. But the cameras either side of the tunnel are working and throughout the city are working. There's no way you could drive through the centre of Paris in a vehicle <laughs> and not be seen on various cameras and just disappear. And all the, yeah, eyewitness, all the eyewitness witnesses that saw these high-powered motorbikes follow the vehicle in and the vehicle... I just think I, 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 that's the only plausible thing I can think of is that the, the security services were there, maybe have clipped the vehicle unintentionally. An accident occurred, and they had to go right. We need to sort this out. We can't. We can't be there. So you talked about Diana, you know, being bombarded by the media everywhere she went. But did she have connections in the media that you were aware of that she tipped off as to her locations? No, she uh, she said to me that. Everywhere she went, they were waiting for her, and and she she knew that she had um, either devices on her car or her phone was being hacked or something. She knew it, and interestingly enough, I said to her, "Who's your?" I've just remembered his name now. It's a long time ago. I said, "Who's who's looking after that side of things for you?" And she told me this guy's name, and I knew this guy, and he was very very good at what he did. And I, and I said, you tell him he needs to be a bit more proactive. That car needs stripping down. He needs to take it in a garage. He needs to strip it down and then put it all back to bits again, you know. Um, but she said everywhere she went, they would be there waiting for her. And and this is the thing as well. The uh, Imagine, right, imagine you're head of the, the secret service of great britain and you're in in london and you're in your office and the princess is kicking about this is 1997 by the way and i uh, and i came in as maybe prime minister or something i said to you sean mate you're in charge of this setup here where are the princes and the princess they're on holiday somewhere and you went i don't know so you don't know where the heir to the throne is <laughs> nah, not got a clue <laughs> Uh, okay, can I suggest you get somebody on this? Because we really need to know where these people are. <laughs> and, and that's the thing when when my evidence of, of, of me saying people were watching us, which, which I thought was really good, you know, we thought it was great. Can you imagine them not having a clue where they were at any one time? No. It's not going to happen, is it? We've no. got the best, well, we can argue with the best. I argue with the best because I've worked with, with a lot of these guys and they are incredible people. We've got the best security service in the world and they don't know where the heir to the throne and the second heir is, by the way. They haven't got a clue where they're doing, what they're doing. And it's just nuts. It's so naive to think that. Uh, so while she was going back to the thing, as she's kicking around London, the, the, it's a highly possible that she had government people watching her and looking at her and, 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 and just being there. Because it'd be nuts not to. Why wouldn't you? So why did you decide to write a book, Lee? Well, it was locked down. It was locked down. I'd just come back from Saudi Arabia. I'd just been out there for five months teaching their military. Uh, first Western contractors, private military contractors ever to go out there. It's a great job. Massive learning, learning curve, loved it. Came back and we had a big project there and I had a big project going on in Mali for the UN. So both those contracts finished with, you know, with COVID and stuff like that. So I'm sat at home with nothing to do whatsoever, doing martial arts online. My instructors are, you know, helping our, our kids do something. And I thought, what am I going to do? And I thought, I've been asked to write a book many times and the time wasn't right. So I got a ghostwriter, and it was a nightmare, this guy. It really, it was so hard work. He, he wanted to write my story like it was his story. And I didn't, I didn't figure this would ever happen. And it got to the end. I had to get rid of him. I said, look, mate, I, I can't do this. It's, it's too much. And then a friend of mine, Nick Dunn, who was one of the Chennai Six, you know, the lads that were in prison in India. We've had Nick on the channel. Great story. Have you? Great guy, Nick. Great guy. So Nick comes back. He's only been in the country a couple of days. He comes on my course, comes on a close protection course. 
because the CEO of this company thinks he'll do him well to get around all military lads again. So he comes on my course and I teach him and I look after him. He's, uh, Nick, I, I love you, brother, but he's like a baby. I had to really look after him. He'd lost everything. He was even struggling to speak, you know, with having that experience and just coming back in. And anyway, he did the course, passed the course, and he's, he's a great guy, great guy. So he writes the book. So I, I call him and say, Nick, you know your ghostwriter? He said, yeah, tell me about him. He said, he's a great guy, this, that, that. I said, would you ask him if he could give me a couple of minutes of his time? I need some, some help. So I called him, uh, Howard, Howard Linsky, and... He said, Lil Lee, you know, I'm really busy. He's one of the top, Penguin's top crime writers. And it's his first autobiography, or the biography done for Nick. Uh, and he said, well, you know, I'm extremely busy and da 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 What's your issue? And I said, well, this ghostwriter was an absolute pain in the ass." And, and, he, said, and he said, well, Lee, what's your story, mate? So I give him a bit blast of my story. And he said, right, Lee, stop. Can I write your book? And I went, yes, yes, you can. So uh, we we did it online through interviews and Zooms and this, and we, we wrote it throughout the whole of lockdown. I'm just uh, looking at it now. You got it very highly rated on Amazon. Yeah, it was number one at one stage uh, of their bestsellers list. And, and I wrote it, Sean, for my kids. That's why I wrote it, because I wanted them to have something to to make reference to to their children about what I what I did because I've done loads of different stuff in the in the security industry and um, that's only half the book half the book we had to take out um, some of the stuff I, I couldn't even put in but half the stories of that we had to take out but Howard said he loved them that much he, we did them all and then they thinned it all down then we got the legal people in and they trashed a load of it that we had to take out and eventually, we come up with the book, as you can see now, The Bodyguard, uh, which is called uh, Saving Diana in, in America. It's exactly the same book. They, they changed the title for some reason. So we have the book, uh, and then my wife writes a piece in there about being at home, thinking I was dead and all this. And I've not read it yet, but she writes the whole chapter in there. I will read it one day. I'll take some tissues out. And then my son, he writes a chapter in there as well about his life with me and how it affected him and did helped him do what he was uh, going to do. But um, I've had some great reviews and Howard is, cause he's such an amazing writer. It, the first time I started reading it, I was like, Whoa, this is me. It's such a weird thing to do. But uh, yeah, it was a project through lockdown. Did they make you take stuff out about Diana and what were the reasons? No, uh, there was nothing about Diana. That, that I took out, um, so everything's in there. But there were certain references to, you know, military stuff and uh, some of the people I've worked with, some of the organisations I've worked with. I, I couldn't put their names in or names of people or this, that and the other. But still, the stories are really cool. The essence of the stories would probably actually be better, to be quite honest. But uh, I had to take references out of certain things and, yeah. So it was a, it was a challenge. I can see you've got fantastic reviews, but do you ever get any threats or blowback? Not really, no. And, Sean, I never read the reviews, never read anything like that. And I never watch the news. I hardly ever watch the news. I don't, I don't read all, this, all the, you know, the comments on the podcasts and stuff like that. I don't read it. Don't read it at all. I don't do it for that. Good. <laughs> but, but, yeah, but working with people who are high profile, like, like yourself, Sean, and that, I know some of them that, that that get into it, it can destroy you, man. Listening to these people you've never met commenting on you and they've never met you and and it, and it hits them. Yeah, I, I couldn't care less. You've got to have thick skin. Joe Rogan said he never reads his comments. It's the sewage sewer of YouTube. <laughs> yeah. So so tell, tell, tell the viewers a little about your karate schools then and how people can join. Well, so uh, we have karate schools at the moment. We've got one in Manchester, one in Blackpool, and we have the rest of them around the Inverness Ab Aberdeen area, which is where, where we live now. And uh, it's called Sansom Martial Arts. Uh, so if people want to come along, generally people come. This, I'm being general now. General people come, and I say most of our people are, are, are under 18. They come, the kids are being bullied. 
Uh, they want more resilience for the kids. Uh, they're out of control. They need new friends. Um, there's something wrong with them. We have a lot of kids with ADHD, autism, things like this, and they just can't do mainstream things. And we're geared up to look after these kids, you see. So generally, people who have those concerns for the kids, just just have a, look at them on, uh, online or on Facebook or something, send us a message, and you, you, one of our team will pick you up. And then generally what we do is the kids come in, Try a few classes, make sure that, one, make sure they're right for us, but two, make sure it's right for them. And then we'll put them in whatever age group they should go in. So we've got the age group, we've got programs for kids from three, and we have dedicated teams that teach all the uh, groups. But our passion is the uh, the sports side of things as well. So we, we have an athletes program, and what we're doing now is we're working towards 2028. So we've got Taekwondo in the Olympics then. So we're, we're looking at some of our team now, and you never know. That's our vision. If we can get them ready and up the rankings, we might be able to um, to change people's lives, you know. But mo most of our athlete kids, we will get them up to national and inter international level. But that, that difference between a world gold or an Olympic medal and winning a lot of international uh, tournaments, it's so slim. And when the athletes get that good, it's just that tiny fine tuning we need to do, you know, and we've got the skills to do it. So uh, we we super focused on our athletes, but also super focused on on our on our student body, you know. So Lee's had an amazing life story. If you want to check his book out, The Bodyguard, there will be links in the description box. If you've got kids that you want to join his karate school, or if you want to get in touch with him about karate, the links will be down there as well. Huge thank you for all of your time today, Lee. Much appreciated. Please let us know what you think about this in the comments. And we look forward to seeing you next time. So cheers. Much love and respect wherever you are watching this in the world. Thank you again, Lee. Thank you.